did. All right, so I owe you a report. Thanks. Okay, now, um, I do want to encourage questions. Um, so let me erase this bullet to solve it. Okay. <laughs> I missed it by two minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do in the beginning of today's class is try to explain to you the structure of these direct spinners. Um, and um, I was all enthusiastic last night because I thought I had um, the simplest description of them. And I started teching it last night and then today. Unfortunately, I spent so much time teching it that um, I didn't finish it. And so, um, well, we'll see. Oh, oh. So th this is a reason then today to go um, slower than usual so I don't run out of my notes. But um, <laughs> so, so you should feel doubly free to ask um, questions. Let me put all this on okay, so we have this action density, it's also called the Lagrange density, some people even call it Lagrangian density. And in Feynman notation in psi bar, d slash plus n psi. And um, I actually find, found my macro for it. Uh, it's probably a better macro though than mine. What mine is. Uh, so that's uh, the action density. Now, let me remind you of, the, of why we have this action density. We have this action density because this psi is here, c and zeta, and this transforms according to one two by two representation of the Lorentz group, this according to the other two by two representation of the Lorentz group. And this thing is invariant on the Lorentz transformation, which means that u of l, this is l of x, really, because this is psi of x. Um, so this thing looks like this. that's what's going on. And the reason why this is good is that then the action is invariant. The action is L of x, d fourth x, and so u of L, s, u inverse of L, is an integral L of L of x, d fourth x. And d fourth x is Lorentz invariant, and so we can write this as L of L of X D fourth L of X and this of course is just the integral L of Y D fourth Y so the which is S so S is Lorentz invariant and in fact in all in all the reason why the Lagrangian and the action play such a big role in quantum field theory is that it's important for the action to be invariant under these various symmetries. And, um, and in fact, that requirement that the action be invariant under the various symmetries Lorentz invariance, translational invariance, uh, and then the various group invariances, which are local, are promoted in the standard model to local invariances, uh, in other words, so that they're gauge theories. Um, they tell us what the 
action density has to be. It has to be something that's invariant over all these things. And so that's what led us to this expression. The equation then, the Dirac equation, <coughs> gamma A dA plus M psi, or in Feynman's notation, P slash plus M psi of X equals zero. Um, well, that's the Dirac equation. That's what makes this stationary. Yeah, how do you get the Dirac equation from that uh, action density? <coughs> how, do you, how do you derive the Dirac equation? How do you derive the, yeah. all right, that's... Or is that really common? That's a little bit tricky. What people do is they just say, um, well, they just take the partial derivative with respect to L bar. That's what people do. What's L bar? I'm sorry, Simon. Oh, so okay. That's what that's what people do. Now the, 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 the fact is that when it comes to these spinners, the techniques that are so um, simple and straightforward for boson fields are no longer so simple and straightforward. Um, but in, in this case, it probably is okay. Um, the, the, all right, here, here's the idea. What you do is you think of, you know, in complex variable theory, you can, you can think of z and z bar as independent variables for some purposes. And so here what you do is you think of psi and psi bar as independent variables. Well, then it's pretty, Oh boy, you have some, you have some, um, something for the hands. You want some? I want some. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to beg for that before I came in, um, and I should have. Take as much as you need. Thank you. That's really wonderful. I, I remember I once took a walk with a certain well-known supersymmetry theorist from Texas A&M. He was talking about some difficulty he had with his health. And it was that, um, I forget what it was, but um, whenever it acted up, he had to do, so, he would do something. And then when it got better, he'd stop doing it. And he said it was, uh, he oscillated between pain and boredom. <laughs> And that's what happens with my hands. I, I put stuff on them when, it, when they hurt. And when they stop hurting, I completely forget. And as a result, I have these cycles of ointment pain, ointment pain. Or rather, ointment pain, and then nothing. Ointment pain, nothing. All right, so where were we? So in other words, if you regard these two things as, as independent variables, then you can say, well, we want the change in the action to be zero when we vary psi bar, for example. And uh, then that gives you immediately the Dirac equation. Okay. Um, and then you say, well, what about varying psi? Well, you can integrate this. In other words, the action is an integral minus psi bar d slash plus m psi d fourth x. You can now integrate this by parts. And, but then you have to fiddle with the gamma matrices. And then you can say, well, what equation do you get if you vary psi independently of psi bar? And you basically get the adjoint of this equation. So that's sort of the derivation. But you're, I'm, I'm glad you asked, but it's sort of awkward. Okay. And um, also the transition from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian is a little awkward. In fact, everything is awkward when it comes to 
fermions. Uh, in fact, this whole, as I keep saying to you, this whole formalism on field theory is, looks very nice in terms of path integrals. But in terms of the canonical approach, it's only simple for spin zero fields. And of course, those are the least important. And one, one lesson one might take of that, it, it, what one might take of that is that perhaps the, um, the, the, the correct formulation for physics is in terms of path integrals rather than in terms of the canonical formulation. Because everything looks more or less the same in terms of path integrals. The part that I haven't shown you yet with path integrals is how you do fermionic path integrals. And indeed, that's very different. And I think I probably ought to do that. Um, but uh, once you do it, then everything does look, it looks a lot better than in the canonical forms. Anyway, um, let me show you this, the, 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 these uh, spinners then. So that's, this then is the Dirac equation. And um, I've got here now, let's think about two Majorana fields. I equals one of, uh, and two. L goes from 1 to 4. So these are four components. And I'm going to write this explicitly. S equals minus or plus. This is the spin index. Integral U sub L of P and S. A of P, S, and I. I is which of the two Majorana fields? S is the spin index. P is the, I'm writing it as four momentum just because it's such a pain to write the arrow or hold face. And um, anyway, it looks nicer. PPI, PX plus, and now what we have is V sub L of P and S, A dagger of P, S, and I, E to the minus I, PX. And then since I've run out of space, I'm going to come back here and write integral dqp over 2 pi to the 3 halves. OK, so those are two Majorana fields with the same mass. And we make a Dirac field out of them this way. We say 1 over root 2 sine 1 L of X plus I psi 2 L of X. And so this is the sum, S equals minus plus integral dqp 2 pi 3 halves. And now this will be UL of P and S. And now I'm going to call this B of P and S to the I P X plus the L of P and S C dagger of P and S e to the minus I P X. Of course P X here is P vector times X vector minus B e T. And E is P upper zero, which is the square root of m squared plus p vector squared. So, questions? Yeah. Type one and type two. They're two different Majorana fields with the same mass. Is that similar for the second line that you wrote? For 
So, so those B's and C's have A's of 1 and A's of 2 with them? Yeah, the, that's right. Okay. Yeah, here, let me. Well, I've been okay. to hand it, especially if I'm left handed. <laughs> well, All right. Um, what is the L referencing? L. L goes from 1 to 4 because these are, after all, look, what the, look what's happening over here. This is a 4 by 4 matrix. And so, how does that work? Well, that works this way, L, L prime, L prime. So there's an implicit sum here, L prime equals one to four. So who asked that question? By the way, I bought a whole new bag here. <laughs> So that, and this thing here is, of course, M is times delta L L <coughs> prime. And so that's the L. L goes right. from 1 to 4. <laughs> and I see that in these notes, I, oh good, there it is. All right, this B of P and S is of course 1 over root 2 A of P S 1 plus I A of P S 2. And um, C dagger, notice it's C dagger of P and S is 1 over root 2 A 1 dagger of P S, no, A of P S 1 dagger plus I a dagger of P S two. So that's why you see this isn't B dagger, because it's A one dagger plus I A two dagger. Because that's what we had here. And B dagger of P and S is 1 over root 2 a dagger of p s 1 minus i a dagger of p s 2 and c of p and s is 1 over root 2 a of p s 1 minus i a of p s 2 okay so I think it's important for you to write down all four of these. I'll add them in the notes. I, in the notes, I only have the top two. Now, the fundamental anti-commutation relations are A of PSI and this is the anti commutator P prime S prime J, which is defined as A of P S I, A of P prime S prime J, plus A of P prime S prime J, A of P S is zero. So that's the that's the magical Dirac color. I don't know who invented that at first. It might have been Pauli. And then 
the other, the, these are course of the Majorana particle uh, operators. A of P S I, a dagger of P prime S prime J anti commutator is delta I J, delta S S prime, delta Q of P minus P prime. So those are the basic anti-commutation relations for the Majorana particles of equal mass. And now, if you now having de de derived these then, these annihilation and creation operators, we can see how this works. And so let me do it. First of all, it's obvious that B and B prime will anti-commute. So let me just write B, B prime. By prime, I mean P prime, S prime, J. And it's also obvious that C, C prime will be zero. And also that B dagger, B dagger prime will be zero. And also that C dagger, C prime dagger will be zero because these would just be A daggers with A daggers. And of course, what's, what, I, what I left out, the fact that these are all trivial follows from the fact that not only do we have this, but the adjoint of that expression is A dagger, A, a dagger prime is zero. You just take the adjoint of this. So the adjoint Majorana, the cre Majorana creation operators anti-commute among themselves, as do the Majorana and Nash annihilation operators. And consequently, these complex combinations of Majorana annihilation and creation operators um, must, um, or of annihilation and creation operators must anti-commute among themselves. And what, what, what is um, interesting is that you get this relation, B, B prime dagger. Well, what will that be? That will be a one half, and then it'll be A of P S one plus I A of P S two anti commutator with and now this will be A of P prime S prime J and it's um, it has a minus R so that's minus R and Okay, well, this is sort of obvious also, namely, at least when you put in the dagger. Notice my left arm is down, so you need to watch a little bit carefully. Should those ones and twos be like I's and J's or something? The ones and twos are tight. Oh, oh. yes, 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 I screwed up. Sit the left arm down. All right, um, you're actually entitled to two. So that's okay, correction. I'm all right. You don't even want one? No, that's okay, I've okay. got Okay, so this works out in a very straightforward way. This one with this one gives you uh, a delta IJ. So this one gives you one half delta S, S prime, delta Q, of P minus P prime. That's A with A dagger prime. And then of type one. And then A with A dagger prime of type two, the I times minus I is plus one. So we get we get another factor, another contribution of one half. But now what about 
a1 a1 with a2 dagger well that's zero because there was a delta F, delta ij here so that's zero and a2 with a1 dagger that's also zero so this is just delta s s prime delta q of p minus p prime so that's what you want but now the tricky part is how about b with c dagger well we want this to be zero and what this turns out to be is again one half a of ps1 plus i a of ps2 so that's b and now we have c dagger that's over here a dagger plus i a dagger so this is a dagger of ps1 plus i a dagger of ps2 okay now we have this times this gives a gives well these are the lines aren't they so this with this gives um, delta s s prime delta q of p minus b prime times one half look well, this one half um, a1 with a dagger 2 is 0 a2 with a dagger 1 is 0 but i a2 with i a2 prime dagger gives minus one half, the minus coming from the two i's, but the same delta s s prime delta q p minus p prime, so that's zero. And similarly, the anti-commutator, well, just taking the adjoint of that, we see that p dagger with c anti-commutator to zero. Okay, so this is, we interpret this thing then as the, in the case of QED, in the case of electrons and positrons, this is the electron annihilation operator. Annihilation. I am so tired of that word. It has so many letters in it, and I never know how to spell it. I always tense up any time I'm typing that word. How do I spell this damn thing? And in fact, I think I misspelled it. It can't be two ends. Somebody Google it. I'm, I'm going to take out these ends. Doesn't look right with one end. Two ends? Anyway, it's. Yeah, in the notes, it's two ends. Okay, um, nihil, by the way, is a Latin word for nothing. So, to nothing, probably. Um, and this is the, and bidaga is the creation operator of the electron. This is the annihilation operator for the positron. And this is the creation operator for the positron. So this is creation E plus creation E minus. Creation E minus creation E plus. All right, now let's go back over here. say about these Meyer runner and Dirac spinners and one can go down this danger of going down almost like Alice in Wonderland. Um, so what is this all right let's let's remember let's see what our, our expression here is. It's either this or that this for the two Meyer runners this for the Dirac but now, if we act on them, 
with this uh, operator, say gamma A dA plus M, on, uh, let us say, one of the Majorana fields. And to make this literal, to make, if I, if I write this really explicitly, this is M delta L, L prime, L prime. And so, in, so we've got this sum over S integral dqp to pi to the 3 halves bracket. And then what we've got is um, gamma L, L prime A, dA. Well, dA acts on this E to the I px, and it's a uh, lower a, so this brings down an i p lower a. And um, what do we have besides that? Ul prime of um, p and s and um, a of, if we're talking minor run, then this is p s i E D I P X. Oh, I left out the plus M. So let me squeeze it in here. Plus M delta L L prime. Okay, then the next one is plus gamma A L L prime. And now we have the derivative, but now it acts on E to the minus I P X. And so that is going to bring down a minus i p lower a plus m delta l l prime v l prime of p and s a dagger of p s i e to the minus i p x right bracket. So I just made it. the uh, right bracket there. Okay, so we get we satisfy this equation. We want this to equal zero. If we just have this work, we have to have these two equations work and it and it looks like this. I gamma A P A plus M, if I now suppress the L indices, U of P S equals zero. And minus i gamma a p a plus m v of p s. So these are the momentum space Dirac or Meyer Dirac equations that the spinners have to satisfy. And if the spinners satisfy these, then the then the field satisfies the Dirac. Okay, now here's a trick. Why do they have to why do they have to satisfy separately? Separate? Why do they have to satisfy separately? Yeah. Because, because uh, when the when this Dirac operator acts on this buyer on the field, you get one piece plus another piece. You want both to vanish. Oh yeah, you're all right, you're right. They could somehow cancel. Well, they can't cancel because these things are operators. And so they're infinite dimensional objects in a sense. All right, so they have to, these, they're, they're linearly independent, let us say. I mean, in, in the, I mean, they are so very linearly independent. Okay, so you need both to vanish. Good question. All right, now, how do we get this? Well, here's a trick. Namely, we write U of P and S as M minus I gamma A P A times a zero spinner. 
and we write V of P and S as M plus I gamma A P A V of zero and S. Okay. Did, I meant to turn off these air conditions, both for the sound and so we don't freeze people. As I told you, the university would get the air conditioning working as winter arrived. I'm going to leave the big formulas for the fields up so that we can refer to them. And I'll try to put these corrected and extended notes on the web page soon. Soon, maybe tonight. And I'll try to think of some reasonable homework. Was the homework too hard or too easy? No it's one's going to say it was too easy. It was very straightforward. Very, very straightforward. All right, so let's see how this works. Um, all right, so what we want to do is we want to see if this is zero, if u of p is that. And so what we get then is I gamma A P A plus M on U of P and S. This, I'm going to pull out the minus sign. There's a minus sign here. So it's going to be I gamma A P A plus M I gamma B P B minus m. So I pulled out a minus sign from here. u of 0 and s. Okay, well obviously this is one of these magical things that we learn in high school. Namely, x plus y times x minus y is x squared minus y squared. And so this gives us, and then we pull in, if we pull in this minus sign, what that gives us is gamma A, gamma B, P A, P B, plus M squared on U of 0 and S. So it's minus M squared, and I pull in the minus sign, and the minus sign cancels the I's. Okay, now, I'm going to write this product of gamma A, gamma B as the sum of one half the anti-commutator plus one half the commutator. So this is going to be one half gamma A, gamma B plus gamma A commutator gamma B P A, P B plus M squared u of 0 and s. All right, now, this term, how big do you think it is? This is symmetric in A and B. This is anti-symmetric in A and B. Small, yes. How small? Zero. Yes. Okay, so that's zero. So we just have this. But this is something that's fundamental. The anti-commutator of gamma A with gamma B is 2 A to A B times the 4 by 4 identity matrix. That's the B definition of these things. So what we have here then, the one half cancels the two, 
we have A to AB, PA, PB times the identity, plus M squared times the identity times U of 0 and S. But what is this? This is just P squared. But P squared here means what? It means P vector squared, and then plus M squared, minus P zero squared. But that's zero, because P zero is the square root of M squared plus P vector squared. So what we've seen here then is that there's a simple recipe for finding the spinners, how the spinners depend upon the momentum. And it's trivial. It's m minus i gamma. It is, in fact, we can write it as u of p and s using Feynman's language. It's m minus i p slash u of 0 and s. Okay? So it's it's a very nice, simple expression. All right, now you won't be surprised to learn that this, that this equation is also satisfied as long as b is equal to this. But I like this thing so much that I'm going to do it explicitly. gives us 2a to ab, or a to ab, pa, pb. The second term vanishes with the scan isometric and is symmetric. And so once again, it's p squared plus m squared, and that's 0. OK, so, so we have these. Uh, spinners then, their momentum dependence is correct because they make the field satisfy the, the Dirac equation. Any questions? 
When you use the symmetry argument, is that, say that again? When you use the symmetry argument of which where the commutator is anti-symmetric and the PAPB is symmetric, is that because you end up integrating something or is it just in general? It's because we're summing. Oh. All right, let me, so if there's a question then, let me, let me just make this explicit. We have gamma A, gamma B, P A, P B. Okay? Well, if A and B are the same, the commutator vanishes. Suppose they're different. Suppose it's one and two. So this thing is gamma one, gamma two, P one, P two, but we're summing over these things. So we also have the term gamma two, gamma one, P two, P one. Okay? These two things are the same. But these two things are opposite. Okay, so the sum is zero. So they cancel in pairs when the uh, when a and b are different, and they're identically zero when a and b are the same. So that's and and this works throughout. Uh, changing what you need to change, this works out. This works. More or less, this, this works similarly throughout mathematics. It just always it's one of the principal, one of the one of the things that keeps mathematicians' blood pressure safely below 200 is um, is things like this. Um, This may be a point for story time, um, so uh, maybe I'll tell you some Lyndon Johnson stories. I'm, I'm reading, there's a guy named Robert Caro who's written four books on Lyndon Johnson. The most interesting one he hasn't written yet because it covers the Vietnam period. And the really interesting thing is why Johnson didn't end the war sooner. Well, he didn't end it at all. He tried to end it at the end in 68. But um, I'm reading the fourth book. I read the third, I'm reading the fourth. Um, and he mentioned some stories about um, Kennedy and Johnson. Some of the stories were about Johnson when he was campaigning for the Senate in 1948. And uh, he was palsy with the various powerful people in Texas. One of them was named Mr. Brown. Um, Brown was a co-founder or co-owner of Brown and Root. And um, Brown and Root was a big construction company and active in the, I think in the oil industry in Texas. Um, anyway, he was a zillionaire. And um, he, he was also Halsey with some, with a lot of the politicians in Texas, and when he was running for the Senate in '48, um, the people who were counting the votes phoned him up and said, "You know, you're behind. You need so many votes." And so Johnson phoned his pal who controlled certain counties on the Rio Grande in Texas, and this guy had those counties send in their results. These results turned out to be, for every vote for Johnson's opponent, I'm telling them a story, okay. for every vote for Johnson's opponent, there were 100 votes for Johnson. So in other words, from these counties, it was 100 to 1, which of course never happens in fair elections. Um, and then maybe an hour or two later, there was another phone call from the people who were counting the votes. Um, we need another few hundred. And so, Johnson, where his people placed another phone call. Oh, some precinct somewhere had discovered a box of ballots that hadn't been counted. <laughs> Johnson went over and won the election. Um, let's see, there were, there were also some uh, stories about Kennedy. They weren't all um, flattering. Um, 
but uh, one of them was the story about his um, behavior in the Second World War. He really was a hero. Um, And I, he was, all his life, he had various illnesses. Um, and um, they were undiagnosed for a long time. Finally, they found out it was Addison's disease. Um, and uh, it was actually in England that it was uh, diagnosed. The American doctors he went to couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and, uh, so just, just to lighten up the atmosphere, I'll tell you a story about when Kennedy was president. Um, uh, he would encourage his wife, who was very glamorous, to go on shopping trips to New York, where um, you know most extravagant stores were. And she'd go on a shopping trip, and of course she was escorted, escorted and protected by the Secret Service. John, so Kennedy had the Secret Service keep in touch at the White House, keep in touch with the Secret Service in New York, because they would naturally. And so once she was out of Washington, Kennedy would have his assistants bring in hookers. These were very high class cold girls. And so there was bedlam in the White House pool with Kennedy and the various associates of his who took part in that. And then when word came back from the Secret Service that Mrs. Kennedy was within distance of Washington, everybody out of the pool and they would bust the hookers back to wherever they lived in Washington, or taxis, I don't know, I'm not saying buses. Um, the press knew about these things, but the press in those days uh, respected the private lives of political figures. Um, and uh, in particular, Roosevelt had a mistress for a very long time, and that was kept secret. And uh, I think Eisenhower also, at least when he was in England, when he was in Europe, had a mistress. Uh, and that was also secret. Um, Johnson. Also a womanizer. Um, anyway, this is perhaps relevant because of the Trey scandal. All right, let me get back to the physics now. I'm going to get arrested. Talk about the Petraeus thing, though. There's this what? There's this other thing about the Petraeus scandal. Uh, sorry, I just had to ask a question. Well, what do you have to say about the um, the fact that the FBI agent who was sent to investigate it ended up uh, sending shirtless photos of himself to the the people involved. Did you hear about this? Sending what? Well, sending. They, um, they sent this FBI agent to investigate the whole situation, and the FBI agent sent shirtless photos of himself to some of the women involved. So there's the scandal with Petraeus, and then there's the scandal with the FBI agent. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, um, I don't know. Boys will be boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just had to add that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, back to physics. All right, so we've got these. Um, we know the, de the dependence now of the uh, spinners. The question is, um, what should we do with the spinners at zero momentum? And. Um, well, the spinners at zero momentum have to satisfy the zero momentum Dirac equation. And so what does this equation become for zero momentum? So since it's right there, I can find an eraser. Um, let's just look at this at zero momentum. Well, it becomes I gamma A M, but a minus sign because P lower zero is minus P upper zero, which is minus M when um, the three momentum is zero. So this is minus im plus m u of zero and s is zero. And what does that say? Well, canceling the m, 
and separating them to both sides, what we see is that I gamma zero on U of zero S is U of zero S. So U of zero S, the zero momentum spinner, is an eigen, excuse me, an eigenvector of I gamma zero with eigenvalue one. And now we take this equation. It becomes I gamma zero. Well, this is a zero. I left it an A. This was a zero. Okay. So this then is I gamma zero M plus M V of zero and S is zero. And this says that I gamma zero V of zero and S is minus V of zero and S. So the, the spinner for the annihilation operator is an eigenvector of I gamma zero with eigenvalue plus one. The spinner for the creation operator at zero momentum is an eigenvector of I gamma zero with eigenvalue minus one. All right. Can you remind us what gamma zero looks like? Marvelous question. So right here is the next page. I don't know if you were hungry or whether you were really curious. Both. I'll, I'll pass it to you anyway. <laughs> gamma zero is minus I zero one one zero. So I gamma zero is a very simple object. It's zero one one zero. Where one by one I mean the two by two identity. So in other words, just to be really explicit, a two by two zero, and then one zero zero one, one zero zero one, or zero 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 zero. And this is the same thing. That's what gamma is, I gamma zero is. So that means that zero one one zero on U of zero and S is U of zero and S. And zero one one zero on V of zero and S is minus V of zero and S. V and U being four component objects. So that means basically that U, the U's have to look like this. A, B, A, B. And the V's have to look like this, A, B, minus A, minus B. Okay. But of course, we want these to be orthogonal in a suitable way and suitably normalized. And so, here's the standard choice. Let me write it down. Zero plus one over root two, one zero one zero. This is the standard uh, choice. Uh, satisfy these eigenvector equations. The, the U spinners, obvious that that's a natural choice. For the creation spinners, I've got it. Uh, first of all, it's obvious that they satisfy the relation. It's obvious that they're suitably orthogonal. What's not obvious is why it is that the plus is down and the minus is up. Um, let, let me say I don't have immediately at hand a good explanation for that. Um, 
but you can imagine that if this thing subtracts a particle, then it so to speak lowers the spin, so this thing raises the spin, so it might you might think that you would flip the spins. Okay, now, um, now let's use these eigen, uh, the, the, the fact that the U's and the V's, I'm not going to use the explicit form here, in fact, it's rarely necessary to use the explicit form of these things. But I'm going to use these relations to um, show you something interesting, namely that this, this um, momentum dependence is, well, I've erased it. All right. You remember the momentum dependence. It's actually rather an interesting, it's more interesting than it looked. And let me show you that. see that I need these equations. that it is minus i gamma a p a okay now remember that i gamma zero u is equal to u so we can rewrite this as minus i gamma a p a and we can just stick in gratuitously an i gamma zero because this is u of zero on x because i gamma zero on u is zero is one okay. and now if we combine the um, if we combine them we see that u of p and s then is equal to gamma a p a gamma zero plus m on u of zero on s. Okay, well what's remarkable is that this is in fact the uh, two by two or the four by four Lorentz uh, representation of the Lorentz uh, boost and in fact it's it's not just any boost, it's the standard boost that takes the particle at rest with spin up or down in the z direction to the particle <coughs> at uh, momentum uh, uh, p, whatever p happens to be, it's this p here. And, um, so let me remind you what that was. I don't know if I ever wrote down the 4x4 four four one. I wrote down the 2x2s two and I said what it would be, but I don't think I wrote it down, so we're going to have to recreate it. The left-handed boost, so we're going to have d1 half 0, 0, 0, d0 zero, 1 half, and uh, both the standard um, the standard boost. And so I'm referring to these, it's, it's, it's example 10.29 in the online notes. And this turns out to be a, a scale factor, 2m of p0 plus m. 
And then up here, this is P0 plus M minus P dot sigma zero, zero. And this is going to be P0 plus M plus P dot sigma. And let me just make really sure that that's what we have. Yeah. Okay, now. Um, Now let's compare that with what we have here. First of all, we've got this M, and then we've got gamma A P A gamma zero. So let's just write that out. Write that out. So gamma A P A gamma zero. So remember what the gammas are. Gamma zero, unfortunately, I've got um, <clears throat> some minus signs happening here. There's a, that's gamma zero over there. Gamma vector is minus i, zero, sigma, minus sigma, zero, let me, let me see. I've got it written down. Yeah, that's right, what do you know? where this is a vector. And so this is going to be, first, uh, the gamma zero, well, it's going to be, oh, there are going to be two minus i, so let's just put in a minus sign. And the gamma zero squared, of course, is one. It's minus one, in fact. All right, maybe I'm doing this too fast. A minus sign from the two a's. And, and then we're going to have, oh, I've, I've done, I'm sorry, it's gamma zero squared is minus one. So we have P zero with a minus on. And then we're going to have um, oh, let me just write it as again a minus sign um, because we have two factors of, of minus i, but now we're going to have zero sigma minus sigma zero, and this is going to be dotted into p, and there's going to be no minus sign from the, okay, so I think, I think that's what I have. And so this is then equal to P0, P0, minus sigma dot P, plus sigma dot P. You notice the left arm is down, so you should be checking what I'm doing here. Um, and now we add M to that. We add M to that. So M plus, or plus M. And we get plus M plus M. And uh, so does P0 have a negative sign? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I left out something. I left out something. So I a, did the gamma p. I forgot the gamma zero. Yes. And so we have a gamma zero here. We style them. A gamma zero. Like that. Mm -hmm. And so this gives us p zero plus m here, p zero plus m there, and then. Um, minus. Yes, minus sigma dot p, and then uh, plus sigma dot p, and then big zeros here. So you see, it's the same thing. In other words, what we've got is we're saying that for the spinner u, 
this spin here is actually um, the square root of 2m p0 plus m. The 4 by 4 matrix that represents the boost on the zero momentum spinner. So that's a very nice relation. Now, what is the thing for, for V? Well, it turns out it's the same because for V, all right, we have just enough time to do this. For V, V of P and S is then I, I and gamma both flashed through my mind, and so we got that. I gamma A P A plus M V of zero and S. But now this is an eigenstate of I gamma zero with a minus sign, so we can write this as minus I gamma A P A gamma zero plus M V of zero S. So let me make sure I've got everything right. I did not write that one out in detail. Oh. Did you have an I in there or something? Ah, thank you, an I. Thank you, that's, so who gave me the I? I'm okay with that. You sure? Yeah. All right, is anybody hungry in the back there? So what we get then is gamma A P A gamma zero plus M V of zero and S. But what we had way over here was that this structure was that, was the boost. And so this is also square root of two M P zero plus M the 4x4 four four Lorentz, the 4x4 four four matrix that represents the Lorentz boost on V of 0 and S. Okay. Now, the reason why this is really nice is that this is why, um, this is one of the reasons, this, it had to be this way in order for the field, psi of x, to transform suitably under Lorentz transformations. Now that's a long story. I can't expect you, you to see that immediately. But you can see that um, if instead the spinners at momentum, at, at finite momentum, were related to the spinners of zero momentum by something that had nothing to do with the Lorentz group, then we'd be in trouble. That's for sure. And the fact that they both have this very nice form is why one can have u of l psi of x sub l u inverse of l p d of l actually it's d of l inverse psi of Lx, remember L is a Lorentz transformation, L, L prime, L prime. So in other words, in order to have this relation, we need this. Scale factors are important, but we need this. Well, the scale factor is also important, but, well, no, it's not important. It's not important because this is a homogeneous relation, so you could do whatever you wanted. You multiply all, 
the, the, the bolt spinner is probably 46 and a half. It still would work. All right, that's enough. We're over, we're over time, unless there's a question. Oh, yes, there's a question. Or a hunger pain. Uh, so at the beginning, you write the side arrow into two terms uh, with U and V. Um, so right. why is it necessary to uh, write <coughs> U and V? As opposed to just the U? Uh -huh. uh, All right, the real reason is this. The Dirac equation, you see, is a little different for V than for U. For U, you bring down an IPA from here. For the U's, for the V's, you bring down a minus IPA. So in other words, the Dirac equations for the spinners let me write them down for you if I can find them, yes. And I'll use Feynman's notation. I, P slash plus M, U equals zero, minus I, P slash plus M, V equals zero. So they satisfy different equations in order for the field to satisfy the Dirac equation. And the reason the equations are different is that when the derivatives act on an IPX, you get a different sign from on minus IPX. All right. All right. I have a quick question. Is it the, in that last equation down the left, is it the U's or the D's that represent the Lorentz group? Like the, the D's. This represents the Lorentz. This is the four by four matrix that represents the Lorentz transformation. So the U's are just any, huh? the U's are just any unitary. The U, four by four which U, oh, this U, that's, yes. that's a unitary operator. Okay. This acts on the Hilbert space of quantum mechanical states, of quantum field theoretic okay. states. This is states in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So it's an infinite dimensional matrix. Notice that it's unitary but infinite dimensional, whereas here, this is non-unitary, but finite dimensional. And the reason this had to be infinite dimensional, if it was going to be unitary, is that the Lorentz group is non-compact. All right. You want another one?